This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, Awareness Explorers. Good to have you. I'm excited about today's session because I'll be interviewing one of my favorite spiritual authors, Andrew Harvey. And if you don't know Andrew, I will introduce him soon. But first, let me just tell people that Brian won't be on the interview today due to a previous obligation. But um, we will be asking Andrew everything that I can possibly think of asking him. He's a man full of wisdom. If you don't know him, he's a British author, religious scholar, and teacher of mystic traditions, known primarily for his popular nonfiction books on spiritual and mystical themes. He's the author of over 30 books, including The Hope, A Guide to Sacred Activism, The Direct Path, and many others, obviously. I was amazed that you also were associated with the Tibetan book of Living and Dying. But Andrew's latest book is called Radical Regeneration, Sacred Activism and the Renewal of the World. And this is a fascinating man with a lot of wisdom. I'm happy to have you on Awareness Explorers. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's interesting. I was looking at your site on Wikipedia and learned a lot of things I didn't know about you. I came across you originally in that you gave an, a talk in Santa Barbara, California, where I used to live. And you were the only person in a lecture series of 20 people that got a standing ovation. That's how much you were able to inspire people with a little bit about your work in sacred activism. And I know your new book is largely about that. I'm wondering how has this focus on sacred activism, how did it start and how is it progressing as you have explored this over time? That's a fascinating question. Let me try and answer that in two parts. I'm a radical, revolutionary, evolutionary, mystical teacher. I woke up quite early in my life to the catastrophe that is our civilization and realized in the 80s that we were headed towards destruction if we didn't transform ourselves and pursue very different ways of being and acting. And that plunged my life into first despair, total despair, <laughs> and then into a determined mystical search, which began when I returned to India. I was born in India, spent my childhood there, then went to England to be educated or miseducated, became a professor at Oxford when I was 21, but at 25, which is when I really began to receive this information, I realized that the world that I was in was incapable of dealing with what I was discovering that I would return to India, which I did. And when I returned to India, I had a series of overwhelming mystical experiences, which I was absolutely not prepared for. And that set me on a very intense 10-year journey, which led to my initial awakening and to my realization that the only force that could possibly counter this destructive force that is now quite obviously in the situation we're in, having an orgy all over the world, is a force that combined and fused together deep spiritual knowledge, passion, stamina, peace, strength, and wise guided, radical, urgent action. Mm -hmm. That realization flowered in a meeting that I had with the man who changed my life forever, really, the great teacher of my life, Father Bede Griffiths, who was a great Christian mystic. Who, who I'm quite familiar with and impressed that you got to know him. He was a great man. How can I say it? I don't think my life would have been remotely the same without getting to know him. I got to know him because I was invited to make a film about him, and it was the end of his life. And our meeting was destined, and we fell deeply spiritually in love with each other, and he communicated to me the secrets of his whole lifetime, one of which was the one that took my vision of this to the next level, and that was that 
through his own experience, he had understood that the world and the whole humanity would come to a global dark night and that it would come soon. He was in 1993 speaking to me and he said it will come within the next 20 years and we're now, of course, in it. And he said it will take humanity to the edge of radical destruction and it will seem like the end. It will be horrific, but it will not be the end because it is a destined, ordained process of purification and galvanization of our deep love consciousness. And then he said something that completely rocked my world and which more and more I'm coming to understand is real and true. And he said, the second coming will not be the return of some Jesus avatar coming down from the clouds to judge all the gay people, <laughs> all those who don't believe in him. That's such a ridiculous vision. The second coming will be, he said, the rising of the golden yeast of Christ's consciousness in millions of human beings. And if you don't like the word Christ, love consciousness, divine love consciousness, embodied divine love consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that completely revolutionized my understanding. And then I had a vision. I had a vision after his death, when I, my father was dying, and I had a vision of the resurrected Christ in a church in India. And it was a double vision because it began with him there at the end of the church, absolutely present, radiating this love which completely engulfed me. And it continued because I ran out of the church and found an armless, legless beggar in a huddle. And as I reached out to help him and give him money and see that he was looked after, I heard a voice, and I believed that it was the voice of the Christ, and it said, you've been playing with your spiritual realization like all your generation. You've just taken all of these experiences to decorate your ego. Mm -hmm. But the meaning of experience is to make you an agent of change, a change of the very horrific conditions on all levels that is now causing massive inequality, the destruction of nature. So get going, because the only question that will be asked of you when you cross over, my dear Andrew, is not how many books you wrote and how many people gave you standing ovations. All of that will mean absolutely nothing. The only thing that will mean anything is what did you do? while the world was burning? What did you care enough about to risk your reputation, your life for, to help others see two things, that the world is in extreme danger and humanity is in extreme danger, nature is in extreme danger through us, millions of species are in extreme danger through us, and that there is a force within us that if we connect with it radically and enact it, can even at this very late moment do two things. Help us co-create with God a new world and birth us into the next force of our evolutionary destiny. Help us embody the divine at a far more radical level than we've ever done before. Wait, before you, before you say too much system. more wisdom, because there's so much there that you just said, I want to unpack a little bit of that. And and you say it so poetically, which is something I really appreciate. You know, uh, thank you. When I, I uh, you may not know this about me, but I've interviewed about a hundred spiritual leaders, everybody from Mother Teresa to the Dalai Lama. And with the first fifty, I would always ask them the question, "What are human beings here to do?" And I stopped asking after a while because to a, every single person, they always said the same thing. And they basically said in less poetic words than you used what you just said, we're here to do two things. We're here to find the peace and love inside of us. And from that peace and love, go and help people in the world. And it's, it's, a, it's amazing that you can get Christians, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, atheists, everybody agreeing on that, and yet we're doing it very poorly. You know, what you I said is be that... a third thing, though. I think I would add a third thing. Okay, I think good. This is perhaps good. the unique contribution of the Christ. Mm -hmm. I think it's not just about serving and helping all beings. It is about standing in the fire of the madness and the fire of the injustice and the fire of the cruelty and speaking up, 
even at the risk of your own life, mm -hmm. for those who are marginalized, whether they're human or animal. There's a prophetic mission that every human being has also. Because you can look at the other visions of enlightenment, and they're very grand and beautiful and holy, and we can learn a great deal from them. But what makes, for me, Jesus unique, and I'm not a Christian, but I am, I hope, on the Christ path, is that Jesus says it's not enough to wake up and just love and help. Mm -hmm. You have to stand and you have to fight from the core of yourself non-violently to overturn and renew and rebirth the structures of cold evil that are now threatening the very existence of humanity. And that is a different message. It builds on the other messages, but it makes a very much more challenging and radical demand of all of us. And we all tremble under that demand, but when we try to rise to meet it, great grace comes to us and we're given, despite ourselves, the courage to do what I've tried to do for 20 years, which is to say, you're out of your minds, humanity. You're pursuing a path that is, will destroy you and millions of other creatures and take a great deal of nature with us and will destroy you soon. Now this great global dark night is upon us. And if you aren't blind or deaf or in denial, mm -hmm. the chances of our surviving the madness that we've collaborated with so insidiously are very slim, unless that third demand whether you say it's Jesus's or the divine's, is met by a rising up on every level of people who are not just prepared to go through the spiritual journey, which is arduous enough, but prepared to put what they are given on that journey into radical practice, mm -hmm. not just going out and sending checks to the Sierra Club and volunteering, which are wonderful things, at the beginning perhaps, but to realize that everything is at stake now. We yeah. have to be braver than we can ever imagine, more upfront, more in the face of evil, more focal in our harm and relentless denunciation of all of the forces that lead to destruction. Wow. Uh... You, you wake up my sense of urgency as you speak about that. Um, and, and of course, I do a fair amount of volunteer work. So, you know, I feel Wonderful. like um, um, uh, but you can fact, right after I mean, this interview, I go... I'm not trying to be rude to anybody who already yeah. is stand up. I'm so grateful for anyone in this Coca Coma society that is realizing that, that that help is needed instead of just the endless individualistic new age pursuant of one's own enlightenment, which is disgusting to me, a betrayal of the reality of the spiritual path. But I think you can see, I hope you can see, Jonathan, that given what we're now going through, which is a multiple, multiple crises, all intractable, all erupting at the same time that we really need to rise in our spiritual grandeur and put what we believe about love into urgent action right now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, democracy will be destroyed, the climate will be destroyed, the animals will be destroyed. We will be destroyed by the consequences of our own inaction, paralysis, vanity, hubris, and apathy. Yeah, and yeah. that's what my whole life is dedicated to trying to prevent. We we definitely are that to that point where we can feel the urgency if you're paying attention. But you said something that I want to ask you about, which is, you know, that you see that some people's uh, focus on spirituality or enlightenment looks off to you, but it seems like people are at different no, levels and some people don't to me it doesn't well, I mean... it doesn't ring true to me because the example that i hold up to myself at the deepest level is the example of someone jesus whose enlightenment didn't express itself in sitting on expensive cushions and feeling awake and having marvelous visions but in risking everything to awaken others and to transform the conditions of life on earth. That to me is authentic enlightenment. The rest is wonderful, but far, far less potent and real than that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, some people get burned out when they get too far into activism and they don't have enough peace. I know that you obviously have explored a lot of mystical traditions. If somebody feels like they really need... I've explored, you know, I'm 70, so I'm going to tell the truth. I have explored a lot of mystical traditions, but I am a mystic. Mm -hmm. These are born from my deep mystical experiences, which I found confirmed and elaborated and deeply understood and known in the mystical traditions. I went on my exploration of the mystical traditions because I was having overwhelming mystical experiences that I needed to understand. I'm 70. I do, with the grace of God, begin to understand them. And what they've revealed to me is that there is a way of risking everything you are, as I have done in the last 30 years. I've been derided. I've been threatened with death threats. I've had (laughs) endless rubbish. But I have never been deflected from what I was given because I've realized, as anyone who's been put in my position throughout history has realized that if you truly combine and fuse in the depths of your being profound spiritual practice with a commitment to just action, Mm -hmm. you will be fed peace, you will be fed energy, you will not burn out. But that means, as sacred activism makes absolutely clear, my book, The Hope, launched a global movement of sacred activists, and there are hundreds of thousands of people who know this. Mysticism of the old kind is simply absolutely impotent in the face of this explosion. It just ohms and schmoms while the whole world burns, and that is not going to help humanity now. The old form of activism that is fueled by anger and righteous anger, righteous rage, and a passion for justice, that isn't going to work either, because the powers that have all the power, all they need to do is to destroy the activists. So so what advice, Andrew, Andrew, what advice would you have? I know people who get into activism, and they do get self-righteous, they get into hopelessness, they get into all these things. And I tell them that you might have to spend more time on the side of peace and meditation before you can go back into the world of of activism. Oh, I think you're right. Uh But the same is true for the mystics that we meet. I teach innumerable mystics who believe the world is an illusion. They're sitting in very comfortable houses, so it's easy for them to believe that the world is an illusion. I meet hundreds of mystics who really think that it's a sign of lower realization to actually care passionately about the world. This is obscene. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just the activists that need to be told, please, please meditate, please, please. Ground your being in peace and joy because you're going into an inferno which will destroy you if you aren't grounded in divine truth. Yeah, They need to be told that with great love and tenderness, but the mystics need to be shaken and told that what they have been shooting up with is the heroine of a very subtle kind of narcissism that gives them every excuse not to care about the dying animals, not to care about the poor, not to relate to the burning of democracy, the shredding and rape of democracy, not to worry at the most fundamental level, calmly but relentlessly, about the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. So the mysticism that we've been fed and reared in is as limited as the activism that we've been inspired to take up, both, both are utterly inadequate to the intensity and horror of the crisis that we have created. The great good news, and there is great good news, and my life is dedicated and radical regeneration is dedicated. I spent five years, day in, day out with Carolyn Baker, getting it as clear as I possibly could, as she possibly could, two elders who've been through this fire. And what we're saying in Radical Regeneration is that the great good news is 
what it is is that the narcissism of the mystic can be healed by the passion of the activist for justice yeah. and the narcissism of the activist can be healed by the passion of the mystic for god and if you bring together in yourself the two noblest passions of the human heart passion for unity with god that is the driving passion of the mystic and the passion for justice of the activist then a third passion is born that unites them both and is the embodiment of the force of sacred activism and that force can change everything that's the force that has been being born over the last 100 years we've seen in the nightmare of the 20th century which is prepared for the apocalypse that in the middle of all of that madness and genocide and creation of concentration camps and horrific rise of crazy people who totally separated themselves from nature and believed that animals are here to keep meat fresh and all the other madness that we've had to contend with including the madness of electing a psychopath as president of the United States in the middle of all of that there've been figures like gandhi like martin luther king like lech walesa like the dalai lama like jane goodall like countless others who have realized that l- having awakening is not enough it has to be put into practice and have experienced for themselves the birth of this radical glorious transformative force and have achieved in the face of absolutely seemingly impossible odds unbelievable progress yes. so we have no excuse either as mystics or activists not to realize that we're being challenged by the vast horror of our time to fuse the depths of the truths of the two and be mystical activists sacred activists embodied divine human beings who express their peace their passion their truth the truth that they discover in the depths of mystical experience of the sacredness of all of life of the sacredness of every being of the necessity for the birth of justice on every level in our world we do that that's the mission of the lovers of god at this critical moment and anything that swerves you from that mission i believe is swerving you from your own deepest realization and your deepest fulfillment yeah and you know uh two things that come to mind in what you just said very powerfully one is that uh this idea of fusing those two uh, activism and mysticism brian and i often use the analogy that if a plane has one wing that's very strong and one that's weak it's going to go around circles and crash yes, and yes. when you get those two wings together you can really soar and they haven't been as fused as they really need to be and I'm I really haven't like your been. message Are you kidding me they've been deliberately separated by the patriarchy the last thing the patriarchy wants is for you to discover that you have that amount of sacred power given to you as an original blessing when you fuse these two because anyone who fuses those two through grace cannot be controlled cannot be defeated however much they're derided cannot be exhausted by any opposition because the divine in both its peaceful and passionate aspects in both father and mother is living in them as them yeah that's the new human and th- the whole with a great deal of the whole of religion and a great deal of the ways in which we've interpreted activism have been ways that the patriarchy has allowed because they keep us secretly split and unable to discover this overwhelming power that belongs to us a power that if we can incarnate it now beyond religion although helped by religious practice then my god even at one minute to midnight we can turn this situation around and birth in ourselves the new human and co-create with god the building of a new world but time is running out which is why those of us who know this are pouring ourselves out and begging people 
to allow themselves to experience this force and stop being so complacent and so brutal and so paralyzed and so despairing and so distracted and realize oh my God, we are the ones we've been looking for, not in that soapy new age way, but we are the only ones now that can embody this force at the moment when the embodiment of this force will decide whether humanity will die out or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, <laughs> let, me, let me take that in. Um, you know this. You know, Everybody when, knows when, this. When I, this when is I not part... something you need to take in, Jonathan. You know that. I, I, you I know, know this. Yes, you yes. do know this. I it's, do. It's, people are so. Everybody knows this. That everybody knows that the claims to love the world don't need a hill of beans unless your love hurts you a little because you're pouring it out to try and realize it in reality. Everybody knows that. Well, let, so let me ask you a question, question you Andrew. Let me ask you. Let... And they don't turn up when you're dying. They don't love you. Let me ask you a question, because when I talk to people, a lot of them express that, you know, they're overwhelmed. They are fearful. They don't have much peace. They are trying to find their center. I know you've done a lot of exploration and, and have had all these waking up experiences. What advice do you, or, or methods do you give to people who feel buried by this this lack of uh, peace and the, the craziness of the current world? First thing I would say, what on earth do you expect in a global dark night? Mm -hmm. What on earth do you expect in a time in which the full karmic bill for two millennia, if not longer, of absolute human hubris is getting paid all at once? The second thing I would say to them is don't be alarmed by the depths of your despair, your paralysis, your hopelessness. Embrace them because they are a form of wisdom. All the old concepts and dogmas and all the old structures and all the old supports are going and will go. And you can either think of this as a complete catastrophe, which I completely understand, but which will not help you. Or you can think of this as a massive, mysterious birthing process in which, as a reward for your courage in embracing your despair, in accepting the intractability of the situation, you will be graced by God, a new being, a new self, a new depth. And the third thing I would say to them, and I would say to them both tenderly and fiercely, because I've been in the trenches of this so-called spiritual world for 30, 40 years now, is that you have been sold a lot of absolutely fake mysticism, and you have drunk the Kool-Aid, and you must stop drinking that, and you must now, I beg you, my dearest friends, practice with an intensity and calm and faith and passion and compassion that you've never imagined yourself capable of, because that is the only thing that will introduce you to the deathless in you. And that will be your only security in a time as devastating as this. And the sooner you get with that frightening but amazing program, the better for you. Because when you do, what you will realize is that what ever happens and what will happen will be terrifying. And this is just the beginning. The world is going to be taken to the edge of extinction for humanity to be purified of its greed and its hubris and to be open to divine grace. The divine is, in one aspect, incredibly ruthless, as anyone who's been through a dark night, as I have, knows. Let, let me ask you about that, Andrew. You use the word divine grace. I'm wondering if you can talk more about your experience with that and what that means in terms of human evolution. Okay. <laughs> How many hours have you got? Uh, give it a shot. Uh, you're, you're pretty good at putting things to words. 
I wouldn't be here without Divine Grace because I went through a 10-year excruciating dark night in which my life was threatened, my sanity was threatened, the life and the sanity of the person I loved most was threatened, all the concepts and dogmas that I clung to and had very deep mystical experiences about all were dissolved. And had not divine grace, especially in the form of the mother, intervened again and again and again and again and again in ways that completely astounded me, I would have died, but I didn't die. I died in one way and was reborn in another. And this is the unanimous testimony of all those who have been brought kicking and screaming through an authentic dark night. On the one hand, that it is horrible beyond anything you can imagine. And on the other hand, that it exposes you to grace, to divine intervention, to miracle, to astounding new vision in ways that nothing else could. How did that grace affect your consciousness? Did it, did it change you internally in terms of how you uh, experienced peace, the world? What did it actually it, well, do? It, it, did, it didn't change my consciousness. It destroyed my consciousness and installed the beginnings of its consciousness. Mm-hmm. A better way of putting dark it. night, you never survive the dark night. If you do survive the dark night, it's not been a dark night. You are transfigured by the dark night. I'm not transfigured enough. I wish there was more of the divine living in me. But I know that I am divine and you are divine. And the difference between what you know before the dark night and what you're given to know increasingly after the dark night is the difference between Newtonian and quantum physics. It's the difference from the awareness of the Neanderthal and the genius of Mozart. It is a completely different life. Mm. I know that God is living in my heart, my mind, my soul, and the cells of my body. Anyone who goes through an authentic dark night will know this. I know that this dark night is the process that's happening all over the world, and that people like myself, and there are many of us, were taken through terrifying dark nights to be midwives at the moment when this dark night would erupt as a great global mystical event. I know that none of the solutions that we are proposing out of our consciousness at the moment, including the spiritual solutions and the New Age solutions and the Hindu solutions and the Buddhist solutions and all of those solutions, none of them are going to work in this situation because there's a new vision coming which will be embedded and embodied in us when we die and are reborn through the excruciating process that has now manifested through the will of the Father Mother, and that we are now being put through kicking, screaming, bleeding, howling, as we always do. So for the people who are in this process of the dark night and having... We're all in this process. You're in it. Everyone is in this process. Some people are having a harder time than others. What advice would you give them? We're having a hard time. Every... Some people are having, the people who are not having a hard time are the people who haven't awoken to it. The people who are awakening to it are trembling and reeling and I reach out to them because that's why we wrote Radical Regeneration. That's why I've been teaching ceaselessly for 20 years. I've known this was coming. So, I've known it's here, and I'm grateful that it's here at last because it gives us a tremendous opportunity if we're willing to learn. So I agree with you that people are are all experiencing this on some level, even if they're denying it. But part of what we try and do on this podcast is give people, I'll call it practical suggestions of how to oh, handle yeah. and how to move forward. And I'm wondering I if... Don't this... say that as if I haven't just spent five years writing a 500-page book with one of the significant elders of our time, which has about 480,000 practical suggestions. Right, right. I mean, I'm not just saying this. I've spent my whole life 
working out multiple different ways for people to right. save myself and to be of help. Nothing is more practical than the book that Carolyn and I has written. Because can without you, this you, kind of knowledge, you can't do anything. I, I agree. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people won't aren't reading nowadays so i'm wondering for those people why don't we encourage them to do so why yeah, don't we, uh, let's let's both encourage we, them. we both are reading we both are good. authors so yeah i i definitely do that but i'm wondering if you can uh guide us or tell us of a couple of things that you think are going to be helpful for people who are just listening to the podcast to to I not be in but go on First of all, I can't save you from pain and suffering and despair. That belongs to being human at this time. And if I saved you from the pain and the suffering and the despair, your heart wouldn't open as far as it needs to. Because one of the things that I learned in my dark night is that the agony is the healing. It's mm. not that you need to be healed from the agony. It's that the, the agony wakes you up to all the ways in which you've been dissociated, uncompassionate, blind, crazily concerned with yourself. And it comes as a divine grace, as a terrible but amazing grace to humble you and to make you aware of just how much you need divine illumination and divine inspiration to be able to take your next step, which is the reality of all of our lives, which we spent all of our lives denying. Yeah. So that's the first thing I want to say to you. And I wish I could save you. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't for a moment wish that I could prevent this because it's the only way humanity can recover from this leukemia of cruelty. It's AIDS of dissociation. And we all have that leukemia and that AIDS. So let me be firm about that and probably scare you a little more. But there's nothing I can do about that. That happens to be the truth, I believe, of the evolutionary process. Well, so the pain what is I part can of the healing. You, no, let me finish, Jonathan. I, sure. You asked me the question. Uh -huh. I, I will. The first thing I will say to you is that you need to study now. You need to study the traditions and especially the evolutionary mystics who know this process and will say to you, there is no way out. There is a way through. And the way through is serious spiritual practice, five different kinds, combined with a commitment to start acting right now, wherever you find yourself, to be of whatever help in building a new world that you can be. A fusion, if you like, of serious pursuit of your divine reality and serious, finally serious and unnarcissistic commitment to stop hiding and say to yourself, I'm in a dark night, I'm going through an evolutionary process, I trust in the process, and I'm not going to wait before I start pouring out my gifts and my resources to really be of as much inspired help as possible. And the yeah. five kinds of practice, and you'll see these expressed both in my book, The Hope, and in Radical Regeneration, are cool practices that you're going to need because you're going to need to calm down. Mm -hmm. And these are the traditional wonderful practices of meditation and breathing and walking meditation. But it's not just cool meditations you're going to need. You're going to also need heart meditations because your heart is going to be battered by what you feel. And you want, you'll want. you find that you want, as I'm sure you do and I do, to close the heart, to say, I just cannot stand to hear any more craziness, any more suffering, any more madness, any more children being destroyed in Ukraine, any more animals vanishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't afford to go to let that happen because if you do, you die. Mm -hmm. You die while living. So you need heart practices that keep your heart molten, juicy, passionate, wild, alive, fierce, gorgeous. And there are many of them. Find them. They're wonderful. And then you're going to need prayer because there'll be some times when cool practices and hot practices just don't hack it because you're too disheveled. You'll get there if you're real. You'll get to places where you'll think, 
you know that you're going out of your mind. But mm -hmm. fortunately, you, won't, you are going out of your mind into another mind. But you may not feel that at the time. And prayer is the essential practice then. And the prayer I use is not my will, but your will. You, you're doing this. You're doing this to me and to everyone else. I trust you. I know it's love. It's terrifying, fierce, savage grace. But I know it's grace. And I surrender to you. That is the most powerful form of prayer. Then you need shadow work because you've been sold, we've all been sold, a lot of ludicrous rubbish about how it's the light is the only reality and that if you just connect with the light, you don't have to bother about all the rubbish inside yourself. This is insanity in a situation like this because you have to wake up to all the ways in which you yourself, I myself, am colluding with this to be able to begin to change it. And we're colluding with it in innumerable ways in, in our personal shadows and in the ways we keep the impersonal shadows that are doing this alive. And the last kind of practice that we're going to need is physical practice, because what's being born now is something far greater, far deeper, far richer than the vision of the old enlightenment systems, marvelous though that vision was. What's being born now is an embodied divine human race, divine in mind, divine in heart, divine in soul, and increasingly divinized in body. It's a mutation that's happening. That's why it's so savage. Mutations are not a walk across the park. You don't just sip and watch them, sip your Chardonnay and watch them on TV. They plunge you into a cauldron of bewilderment. When species change, they face situations that absolutely terrify them. So they deeply, they go deep into the depths of themselves to find a passion for yes that then takes them through whatever transformations they have to go through to become the next level of what they essentially are. This is how it works in nature, and this is how it works in supernature. They're obviously aligned. So you need physical practices like sacred dance or yoga to really feel the golden fire juice of divine energy inside yourself, and to allow the divine light to take your body over increasingly and make you into love's wild holy body so those are the five kinds of practices and let me just what... i want to make sure because that is a very thorough list you have physical work shadow work prayer meditation did i miss one cool practices meditation to, to found your whole being in peace heart practices to wake up the heart when it's shattered Prayer practices to align yourself with the secret will of the divine in all circumstances. Shadow work to constantly, constantly make conscious the dark inside you, which is holy and which is also part of the one. And physical practices to enable you to experience the radiance and passion and stamina and vitality and vibrancy of the divine energy in your body. When you combine those, all of those, and choose simple ones, because it is simple, you just have to do it. Yeah, you yeah. be born increasingly into the unified force field, into the mother-father, into your divine human. You understand viscerally what Kabir means when he says, my father is the absolute Godhead, my mother is the embodied Godhead, and I am their divine child, dancing for them both on their burning dance floor. You become, in fact, a sacred activist, transfigured dancer, someone who is able to combine a deepening experience of their own divinization with a more and more passionate commitment to social just action. That's the new human. It's here. You say it so well. No, that's a pretty <laughs> incredible list. I like that list. Um, I'm glad. And and I would assume that at different points in the journey, you have to focus on one more than the other. Exactly, because the first thing you have to do, I think, first thing I did was to ask myself a very uh, uh, kissing question. Which one of these two kinds of people are you? Are you the kind of person who just 
tends to relax, chill out, take even the end of the species as a kind of new thought. Is that there are a lot of them around? They're called I call them the already zombified. They are you don't have to wait for the zombies to take over. They've taken over in so many different ways. The other kind of person is the kind of person that I was, and I hope I'm not anymore. I'm, I mean, I hope I still am in certain ways, but I hope I've transcended it a bit. Is the person who is so stricken, so heartbroken, so outraged that they're threatened by madness and also by collapsing into the kind of anger that destroys instead of transforms. Mm -hmm. So you have to really ask yourself, are you too chilled out or are you too hot? If you're too chilled out, then do the hot practices. They will transform you. Unite yourself with your burning, compassionate heart and get off your ass and stop sipping your Chardonnay and stop pretending that it's going to be okay just because it's already okay and it always will be okay, the kind of garbage that repeats itself endlessly in spiritual circles um, ensures our destruction. If you're too hard and you want to kill people and you want to scream all the time and you're falling about in agony and paralysis, realize that's not going to be of help anymore and do what I do, which is I, I concentrate on the cool practices. I concentrate on calm and grounding and peace and i find that when i do the passion that is my greatest gift is more and more rounded in peace and the decisions that i make are far more lucid and far more transformatory so you have to decide which kind of person you are then do the opposite and I, I totally agree. To your opposite yeah does that make sense to you jonathan it, yeah it, you know i was with a teacher for 26 years that so that his basic tenet was always focus on the opposite of what, uh, well, like really focus on your weak leg. Yes. And well, if you go to an analysis, a great analyst, they will always be able to tell you what your inferior function is. My analyst, amazing union, never failed to point out my inferior function, which is sensation, and say, look, you're going to be marooned if you don't cultivate exactly what your weakest at. As an athlete mm -hmm. would be told by a good coach, right? Mm -hmm. You're great in you're great doing this, but this you're a bit wonky. You have to build your leg muscles. It's the same in the spiritual path, right? I totally agree. Yeah. Well, this has been really valuable. I know that you want to create some time for doing a specific practice that you mentioned before, um, a three-part practice. I'm wondering if you could talk about that, maybe even guide us through what that looks like. Before I do that, I would just urge you all to read Radical Regeneration because it's, I know many of you followed my work for many years, but this is the distillation of my work. And this, if I died now, I would die happy because I've given you with Carolyn everything I have learned and known at a time when I believe that it can be of really uh, extraordinary help to you. It's helped me getting to know this and it's helped me writing this and it's helped me giving this to you. So please don't take this as just another of those Zooms that you you know, taste different teachers at, please. I'm not claiming to be any more important than any of the other teachers, but I know that the message that Carolyn and I have been entrusted to give you is a unique message and that there is no book available to you now that has this vision with these maps. Mm -hmm. Before so people, before you go into the meditation, how uh, people can learn more about you, of course, get your book on Amazon, but is the best way to uh, learn more about you at andrewharvey.net? I think the best way to learn more about me is to go and look at the free videos. But more importantly than that, the best way to learn about who I am is to learn about who you are. Mm. Because you'll discover when you go on the, the deepest journey you're capable of, that it will wake you up to the truths that I have been, God knows why, given to give to you you will discover them. I'm not a guru, I'm a friend, but I'm someone who's been through a very frightening and very amazing experience, and I'm sharing that. And as you go through 
frightening and amazing an experience. You will come to understand just how much treasure there is in what has been given to Carolyn and I to share with you. Mm -hmm. So you really never know much about people who have the most to give to you unless you go on a very deep journey in which you increasingly recognize them in yourself. Mm. That's part of the extraordinary game we're all playing. It's part of what Jesus was always saying. He's saying, you know, don't endlessly idolize or explore me. Realize I'm voicing you. I am a different iteration of you. Yeah. Because the more you know about you, the more you'll know about me. Don't you have that realization? Don't you? Don't you know that people look? How many? How many ways can they see you and I? Two guys chatting, they could see us like that, or you as a very sweet and wonderful and clear and loving interviewer, and me as this old guy who's had this reputation and prestige. I mean, there are thousands of ways in which our encounter could be classified and experienced in ways that distance us, right? But we're all connected. And we're all connected, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. we're all each other. So, anyone who's been thrilled by anything that I've said, claim it in yourself. Claim it as your own realization. It's not Andrew. Andrew Harvey is just a part of you. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so? I totally agree. Yeah, and right. once you have that realization, no everything anymore. changes. We don't need gurus. We need real people. Be a real person. You'll find out other real people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Everybody, it's so funny because, I mean, I'm, I'm laboring this because one of the appalling things about the whole American system is how it celebritifies everybody. We're all at a certain level of success, whatever you call success. We're then projected into being a brand and then we're this person who is, and it's a complete catastrophe because it separates yeah. And the people and everybody's in on it. The people who make money from it, the people who actually enjoy being thought of as special, and the people who allow themselves to be hoodwinked by people who enjoy being thought special. All of that prevents real growth. So if you want to experience this vision that I'm sharing, go on the journey. You'll see it's true. And you see that there are many visions far greater ahead which I don't have to give you at the moment, but which I will damn well try before the fat lady sings to share with you, my brothers and sisters. But not if you think of me as a guru or as Andrew Harvey, but if you think of me as a part of yourself, speaking to yourself, sometimes annoyingly, but sometimes with a lot of love and hopefully but always with a lot of even with power you know. and urgency, and I really appreciate that, Andrew. Um, you know what? In I'm limited time about, we have left. Uh, let's let's talk about this three part uh, uh, practice that you often suggest to people. Yes, but you see, I'm not going to give you this practice if you're not going to do it. Why should I? I'm 70 years old. I've been working in the trenches of the new age for 40 bloody years. I've given thousands of practices and people sit back and just think, oh, this sounds interesting and never do them. Mm -hmm. So I hear you promising me that you're going to try. I am. Yeah. This. yeah, because this is real stuff. This has been tested all over the world and people are really being transformed by this. I'm not just one of the other peddlers of stuff i've been through enough to claim that i'm authentic and you can judge for yourself mm -hmm. so i'm giving you these practices to help you experience the birth of the divine human in yourself because if you do these three simple practices in the order that i tenderly suggest something i swear on my immortal soul will become clearer and clearer in you and you join the stream of the divinized ones. Mm. Can't promise you that it'll happen over a weekend. It may take many, many years. It does take, frankly, many, many years, but you get it because God wants you to get it. Mm. So the first practice is very simple. It's to, before, let's start at the very beginning. Before you begin to practice, 
just try and understand what practice really is. Practice is love making to the beloved, to your greater you. So don't go to practice in a dull frame of mind, just you know, dutiful and all that. Try and perfume your mind. Try and begin to inspire yourself with beauty. What I do, it might help, but you find out what really gets you going. I read a Rumi poem, or I put on Bach, or I put on Tina Turner, whom I absolutely adore. And I charge my being mm. with, ah, oh, that's it. I want to be aligned with that beauty. So before you begin, just wake your whole being up in adoration. Then sit down and for 15 minutes, just allow your mind to settle. Just breathe in and out and watch your thoughts in imageless meditation. So you bring, as far as you can, you let being itself calm your mind so that you can come increasingly into the depths of who you really are. Because your mind, all of our minds, separates us from both our hearts and our bodies. So that's the first step. And then in the second 15 minutes, I urge you to say the name of the divine by whatever name you love the divine. And if you don't believe in the divine and you don't have a name, say love, 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 love and wake up your heart center through that passionate commitment to love. There are many names for the divine, and of course the divine is beyond all names, but the miracle of the name of God is that it acts as a lens that focuses the divine powers on you exactly as you are. And that sounds like great poetry, but wait until you actually practice this humbly and you'll discover what the great mystical evolutionists have discovered, which is that this is the most important practice for our time, this time of Kali Yuga. All the great mystics of Kali Yuga said, in the last age, when we will either be destroyed or be reborn, saying the name of God will be the key. Kabir said that, Ramakrishna said that, and all of us who love them and honor them say that. And it is my essential practice. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. as much as possible all the time. So after 15 minutes of really, really opening your heart in adoration through saying the name tenderly, tenderly, passionately, deeply in the core of your heart, in the last 15 minutes, get up and dance. So prepare yourself a CD, your own CD of all of your favorite dance music. I'll send you mine if you like, but I'm, I'm mine is very 70s and 80s, so you're all, many of you are probably far more advanced as far as, and more multi-leveled in your dancing. I find that, you know, Tina Turner, I'm a Tina Turner addict, so Tina Turner is the one that helps me most in this. Uh -huh. And flamenco and actually Bach, because Bach is all dance. Dance permeates Bach. Find the music that wants you make, that wants you to just explode in every cell with joy and celebration and adoration and passion and embrace of all of life and dance. But as you dance in that last 15 minutes, dedicate the joy that will flood you to every human being and every animal and every plant and through the great birth of a new humanity. Don't just do it for yourself. That's so boring. Do it for and as a microcosm of the microcosm, as a representative human being standing in for all human beings. And you discover 
that if you do that quietening of the mind and the opening of the heart and then follow it up with the energizing of the body, the flooding of what you've learned through quieting the mind, the flooding of what you've learned through opening the heart of your whole body, you, something very amazing will start happening to you, which is that over time, you realize that the distinctions between heart and mind, body and soul are just mental. You are one radiant, mysterious thing. You are an ensouled body and an embodied soul. And that's the beginning of the divinization process, which will continue the more you do the practice. Mm. Wonderful practice, wonderful practice. I fun am excited too. about doing fun. that. Yeah, yeah. People have so much fun. I had, you know, this has got to be done in joy. I know I've been speaking fiercely, but the reality of it all is that joy is the power. So getting into this dynamic joy that is the core expression of God, God, God's ultimate nature is Ananda, is the great bliss. And that great bliss creates everything. So the more you can ground your whole being in the great bliss, not in the new age sense to go off into that great bliss and just let the world burn, but in the sense of the Christ and of the great pioneers of sacred activism, like the prophet and other amazing people, the great bliss to give you the strength for the great holy battle for the future of humanity, then amazing things are possible. Well. I appreciate your wisdom, your passion, your practices, and your sense of urgency. They touch my heart deeply, Andrew. And I know our listeners are grateful too. I know well, also both of us you. have appointments we've got to get to, but uh, uh, this has so, been wonderful. Please don't send me any outrageous emails. I've had them all. I'll publish them when I'm dead. I've been called everything already. So anything that you're tempted to say about what I've said, don't worry, it's been said. And I haven't listened to it, right. and I'm well, not going to listen to it. You're, you're so. a brave soul, sir, and and uh, I thank you for that passion. I thank our listeners for for being on this journey. Um, we appreciate our Patreon supporters. If you want to find out about that, go to patreon.com forward slash awareness explorers. And until next time, friends, keep exploring. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.